Welcome back everybody to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, the UCI World Championships have begun with a record-breaking speed at the men's individual time trial. Elsewhere, we've had a couple of closely fought stage races in Luxembourg and Slovakia, and after the first few autumnal one-day races in Italy, we're asking if Sonny Colbrelli is the big favourite for the World Championships road race. We'll start with the first event of the World's Week in Flanders though, the men's individual time trial. On a pan flat 43 kilometre course, the pre-race favourites were Filippo Ganna, Stefan Kung and home favourites Wout van Aert and Rimko Evenepoel. And it was the youngster who set the benchmark having been one of the early starters. Despite losing his bottle midway through, literally rather than figuratively, he stopped the clock with a time of 48 minutes and 31 seconds and an average speed of 53 and a half kilometres per hour. It was a performance which certainly gave the crowd something to cheer about, and that was my main take home after watching Evenepoel race. The crowds. How cool was it to see Belgian cycling fans back out in force? And this was for the time trial, let's not forget. They are going to be huge next weekend for the elite road races. It's the first time that crowds have been allowed on the roadside for a major cycling event in Flanders in a year and a half, and I didn't realise quite how much I'd missed it until I watched that time trial yesterday. And they had a lot to be pleased about. Remco got quite comfortable in the hot seat as the likes of Bissiger, Kung and Askring failed to surpass his time. And it also became evident from the splits that Avonapool had ridden extremely fast between the first and second time checks. And looking at his Strava power, you can see why he was going so fast. His average power for the final two minutes of his ride was 417 watts. That's a power to weight ratio of 6.73 watts per kilogram at the end of his effort. And his average for the whole ride was 384 watts or 6.2 watts per kilo. Now the crowds erupted even more when Wout van Aert left the start ramp and further still when he got to the first time check. He was flying. Even Filippo Ganna, last man off and defending champion, was seven seconds behind him. It looked as though Van Aert was finally about to turn three silver medals from major road championships into a gold. Ganna, though, had other ideas. By the second time check, there was less than a second between them, so it would all come down to the last few kilometres and who had the most left in the tank. And he's quite a big tank, Ganna, isn't he? So I guess it shouldn't have been a major surprise to see that it was him with the most left to give. Van Aert crossed the line with a time 38 seconds quicker than his younger compatriot, but he didn't even get to the hot seat because 86 seconds later, Ganna broke the heart of Van Aert and every Belgian cycling fan at the finish line. And there were a lot of them there. Take a look at this short video from Flanders Classic CEO Thomas van den Spiegel. Brilliant stuff. Van Aert was very quick though to go and congratulate Ganna, but he must be wondering now when he's going to win gold on the road at a major championships. He took silver in both the road and time trial events at last year's Worlds in Italy, silver in the road race at the Tokyo Olympics, and now silver in his home world championships. You have to tip your hat to Ghana though, don't you? What a beast. He has been a little less consistent this year versus last, but he does seem to be able to raise his game for the biggest events of the year, which is what makes him such a formidable and feared opponent to the others. His average speed yesterday was a record for the event, 54.37 kilometers per hour average. I mean, I know it was flat, but that is so fast, unbelievable. Uh, he's still got a little way to go though until he surpasses Tony Martin's record in this event. The German announced last week that he will be retiring from the sport after the mixed relay event later this week, citing concerns over safety off the back of some nasty crashes in recent times. And I would say he's bowing out on a high. Sixth place yesterday is very respectable, and that ends a run of 13 top 10 placings in the last 14 editions of the World Time Trial Championships. In that time, he won seven medals in total for Germany, four of them gold, making him the most successful rider ever at the UCI Individual Time Trial World Champs. He's also won five stages of the Tour de France and 10 stage races in his career. And we wish you all the best, Tony, for whatever comes next for you. Also in the top 10 on the day was Tadej Pogacar, clearly not in the form that saw him dominate the Tour de France in July, but a solid ride nonetheless. And he'll play an important role for Slovenia on Sunday in the road race. He also got engaged last week to longtime girlfriend and fellow pro cyclist Erska Ziegart, so our congratulations go out to both of them. 
Another notable performance yesterday came from Dan Bigham, who took 16th place on the day for Team GB. Now, a lot of you will have heard Dan commentating for us in time trials at the Jura and the Tour, but he also works very closely with the Danish track squad and Jumbo Visma, amongst others. But he's also pretty quick in his own right too, if yesterday was anything to go by. He beat the likes of Kwiatkowski, Biel, McNulty and Czerny, and was less than 20 seconds away from the top 10 on the day. Great stuff. The World Championships continue today with the men's under 23 and elite women's time trials, which will likely have finished, in fact, by the time we get this video out. It was a great start to the racing in Flanders yesterday, but unfortunately, it couldn't have got off to a worse start beforehand. The cycling world was shocked and rocked by the news that Chris Anker Sorensen had been knocked off his bike on Saturday in the local area, sustaining fatal injuries. Dane had been a pro rider for 14 years, but since retiring at the end of 2018, he'd become a respected commentator for Danish TV, which is what he should have been doing this week in Belgium. He leaves behind a wife and two children. Our love and condolences go to them and everyone that knew him. Rest in peace, Chris. Let's move on now to the stage races from last week and we'll start with the Tour of Luxembourg, a race that's moved from its traditional time slot earlier in the year and now in September. It's part of many stage races that riders now use to prepare for the World Championships. It's a fantastic race in its own right though and this year was fiercely fought amongst the many big names that took part. The first stage ended up in an uphill sprint. Mark Hirschi went early, looking to take his first win of 2021, but he ran out of gas before the line. Balka Mollema got past him, but leaving it until just 50 metres to go, Joao Almeida of De Koenig Quickstep flew past both of them to take yet another win. He would then back that up with a second place on stage two, but he still lost the race leader's jersey that day because eight seconds in front of him was Hirschi. Uh, that day was particularly grim in terms of the weather, but it clearly didn't affect the rider from Switzerland. Now, we've not really seen him on top form so far this year, but it does look as though he's getting there now, doesn't it? That's the third pro win of his career and his first since La Flèche Wallonne just under a year ago. That wind drought had been much longer for Sasha Modlo of Alpes in Phoenix. He sprinted to victory on stage three, raising his arms for the first time in three years and seven months. And that team can't seem to stop winning at the moment. That was their 28th of the season. And they'd had two more since then, which I'll get on to shortly. The stage four time trial was always going to be pivotal though in the battle for the GC and it saw Almeida go back to the top of the GC table. He finished second on the stage, eight seconds behind his teammate Matteo Catania. And that was the team's 58th win of the season and 18 of their 32 rider roster have now won at least one race this year. Astonishing. With Hershey 47 seconds down on Almeida on the day, it gave the Portuguese rider a comfortable lead in GC and one that he comfortably defended with his team on the fifth and final stage. He, Hershey and Kuznofoy had opened a small gap on the last climb, but after sitting up, they were caught and that allowed David Godou to sneak away and cling on for the stage win. Almeida was second and comes away with another stage race win off the back of the Tour of Poland recently. He hadn't won a single pro race before June of this year, but he's now got six, and that is a very strong signing for UAE Team Emirates ready for next year. Meanwhile, Slovakia were also hosting their own stage race last week, and the crowds were out in force as they cheered national legend and world cycling legend Peter Sagan. He gave them plenty to get excited about too. Not once did he finish outside the top 10 over those five stages. In fact, his worst result came in the prologue where he was 10th, that being won by young Australian sprinter Caden Groves of Team Bike Exchange. The four road stages would all end up in bunch sprints and all won by different riders. Jose Alvaro Hodge on his 25th birthday, Janneke Steimler, Christopher Halverson and Itamar Einhorn were those four winners. And you will notice that Sagan is not amongst them. However, in finishing second, second, third and second, Sagan managed to clinch the overall title, which is his sixth win of the season so far. You definitely cannot count him out of the World Championships fight, can you? He'll be there in the mix for sure. And it's great to see Itamar Einhorn nab his first pro victory on the final day of Slovakia. He's got a very bright future ahead of him. Let's move on now, though, to the plethora of one-day races that we had last week. The season certainly doesn't seem to be winding down. It's better than ever right now. I'll start in Italy, where the autumnal classics kicked off with the Giro della Toscana. The Monte Senna climb is tackled twice in the second half of that race. But with the final peak coming with around 30 k's to go, it does give riders the chance to get back on if they've been slightly distanced. And that's exactly what Michael Velgren did. EF Education Nippo had ridden a dominant race, always with numbers at the front, and the Dane took advantage of that and some very good legs to solo away to the win, and he had plenty of time to soak it all up as he approached the finish line. 
That marked his first win since Amstel Gold three and a half years ago. But he didn't have to wait long for his second. It came just 24 hours later at the Coppa Sabatini. Once again, EF had numbers up front the whole time, but the problem they had was that Sonny Colbrelli was present in that group. However, despite boxing Felgren in to the point that Dane had to push him back so as not to go into the barriers, Colbrelli didn't have the legs to hold him off. Michael Felgren is back, ladies and gentlemen, and he forms part of an incredibly strong Danish lineup for the World Championships on Sunday. Colbrelli took revenge at the Memorial Marco Pantani two days later. There, a group of around 20 forwards it out for the win, with Colbrelli getting the better of Vincenzo Albanese. Fourth that day was Matteo Trentin, but he took the win 24 hours later at the Trofeo Matteotti. So Italy also have a fantastic lineup this Sunday, but it's Colbrelli who has been the standout performer over the last few months. Now looking at his recent results, he's been first, second, DNF, first, second, first and second over the last few days of competition for him. Does that make him the favourite for the World Championships in Belgium? In my opinion, no. He hasn't faced up to Wout van Aert in any of those races, and I think in a head-to-head -head battle, Van Aert will come out on top. That said, Colbrelli won't be under quite the same pressure as Van Aert in his home country, and anything can happen. We'll just have to wait and see. Outside of Italy, we had the Eschborn Frankfurt in Germany, a race that ended in a bunch sprint. A sketchy one at that. I had my heart in my mouth in the last kilometre, just crossing my fingers that everybody would stay upright. Emerging unscathed and quicker than everyone else was Jasper Philipsen of Alpersen Fenix, his second win in three days. He'd also raised his arms aloft on Friday at the Championships of Flanders, where he'd beaten Dylan Grunewagen. In Frankfurt, it was John Dagen Colby beat to the line, with Alexander Christoph coming in third. Up in Belgium, on top of the Championships of Flans, we also had the Primus Classic and the Hoeks of Pale at the weekend. Probably haven't pronounced that right. Uh, but in the former, it was Florian Seneschal who outsprinted Tosh van der Sande and Jasper Sturven to the line. After some great work from his teammate Mikel Honoré in that small group. In the latter, de Koenig were at it again. Fabio Jakobsen taking his sixth win of the season, all of them having come since the end of July. Now, Mathieu van der Poel was there for both those races, finishing 8th on Saturday despite a puncture 20 k's out and 46th yesterday. We do still await his decision on the World Championships and Paris-Roubaix, but Sport Herald have said his participation on Sunday is now 95% certain, which would be great to see. Now, just before we move on to cyclocross, a quick update on what's coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, and it is dominated, as you can imagine, by the World Championships. They're on live every single day this week except for Thursday, and Elite Road Races will have pre- and post-race shows for you too, hosted by Orla Shenoui. There are some territory restrictions on those races though, so please check what's available where you are. Beyond that, we have the Grand Prix Dinan tomorrow with Philipson, Van der Poel, Kwiatkowski, Pidcock and Laporte amongst those lining up. And then we've got a big weekend of cyclocross coming up with the third round of the Ethius Cross on Saturday and the first two rounds of the brand new US cyclocross series on Saturday and Sunday evening, European time. And that is an exclusive to GCN and we are really looking forward to bringing you top level action from the US cyclocross scene, which has been thriving, as you all know, in recent years. Let's move on to the cyclocross racing from Saturday now with the second round of the Ethius Cross Series in Beringen. And I'd like to start by apologising for the technical difficulties we had for the women's race. Unfortunately, we had some issues getting Rob Hatch connected, which meant that Tom Last had to fly solo for that race. And I thought he did very well, considering he wasn't expecting it, and he hasn't done much commentary, so thanks for stepping up to the plate, Lasty. In that women's race, it was Yara Kasteline who dominated from start to finish. Now riding for Ico Kralan, the Dutch woman got the better of fellow Dutch women, Shirin van Anroy in second, with round one winner Denise Betzema having to settle for third. Eddie Isabit backed up his round one win with another win on Saturday. He'd gone clear reasonably early in the race, and despite both Lauren Swake and Lars van der Haar getting close, neither of them were able to get up to his back wheel. So, victory number two for Isabit already, and it's going to be interesting to see how he compares to the likes of van der Poel, van Aert and Pidcock when they return to the dirt. We'll finish, as ever, with a few bits of transfer news, and the biggest news on that front is that Miguel Angel Lopez's contract with Movistar has been officially terminated. This, of course, is off the back of his surprise withdrawal from La Vuelta on the penultimate stage of the race. Now, his destination is as yet unconfirmed, but he has been strongly linked to a move back to his former team, Astana. Mark Cavendish and De Koenig Quickstep look close to reaching an agreement to extend his contract. Patrick Lefebvre has said the only remaining sticking point is his role within the team once he retires from racing eventually. 
Mawari Kudus uh, will move away from Astana next year. He's the latest new recruit for EF Education Nippo. We've also extended the contract of Michael Thelgren. And that wasn't just off the back of his two wins last week. He'd apparently already put pen to paper a couple of months back. Pelo Bilbao and Mikel Lander have both extended with Bahrain Victorious 2, whilst Canyon Sram have signed Paulina Royakas and Shari Bosoit. And that brings us to an end of this week's GCN Racing News Show. We'll be back next week with a roundup of the World Championships. And I cannot wait, particularly as I'm heading over there on Friday, to be there. My first trip abroad for over a year and a half. Happy days. Uh, cheers, everyone. I will see you very soon.